There, we'll go ahead and get started. I wanted to give plenty of time for our lesson today. If you picked up a handout out on the table outside, again, I know I say this every week, but these are some of our very favorite missionaries, and all of our missionaries, except the uh, very young ones, are getting uh, long years of service. We've supported Bill and Tammy Brower in Kenya and Tanzania since August of 2003, but they've actually been on the field in Tanzania and Kenya since 1993, so that's just a few months away from 30 years. We have a letter here from uh, Bill, and uh, particularly for Tammy with the women's ministries that they've started. Uh, much of Africa, women are second-class citizens. Uh, they mention it in here that uh, most of the time, child labor is young girls that are forced into domestic servitude with no education and no health care and no standing. So their outreach to young girls is really dynamic. There's a, a bunch of women here with Tammy that she's discipled over the years and they're growing in Christ now, but you can tell a ministry if they reach out to everybody and not just to the people in power. So unless you're going to ten Tanzania or Kenya, which if God calls you to do, you go right ahead, stay here with us and give and pray and, and work through Faith Promise Missions and you'll have a part of it and it'll make a difference in your future. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 13. We're in lesson three or four in a short series called A Word to the Wise. I had a friend that had an argument. Well, he was a preacher, and he had an argument with another preacher. He was a Bible college president, and the other preacher was in a church nearby, and they got into some kind of argument, and it got really bad. I thought it sent one of these stories you hear about, and uh, they were going to meet, and they, they couldn't even agree where to meet. They were so mad at each other. So finally they decided to meet in the parking lot, which was exactly halfway between the Bible college and the church. I mean, I don't know if there was guns drawn or music in the background or something, but uh, one of them that I know well, who I think was probably in the right about this, but I'm certainly not gonna get involved in that. I said, what did you do? He said, well, it, it worked out well. I was prepared when I got there. God just seemed to melt his heart and give me the right words to say. I said, well, how did you prepare the night before? He said, I sat up for hours. I read through the entire and prayed through the entire book of Proverbs so that I was absolutely full of God's wisdom in a practical sense. And he said, it was amazing. And I thought, it's amazing. I've never thought about that. That makes perfect sense. And it didn't take days. I mean, it's not that long. Now, there is wisdom and power and uh, advantage to you and to me in, in, in God's word of Proverbs. The title of the message today is True Riches. You know that almost all the parables and stories in the New Testament are illustrated or applicable to money because money is who you are. Money is your life. Without money, you don't get toys at Walmart or burgers at McDonald's. And that's what's life without that. So we, we, you do need to understand when it talks about money, it's talking about that which is closer to your heart. Today we're going to talk about true riches. Good news, you may be in what matters wealthier than you think. Uh, bad news, some of you may be bankrupt in the only riches that matter even though your bank account's looking pretty good. So let's start looking at Proverbs 13 verse 7. It says, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Great riches, yet no big bank account. Little riches, yet no big bank account. Uh, the most vital nerve in the body for the Baptist runs from the wallet to the mouth to the hand. Once there was a Baptist who had a pious look. He'd been totally immersed, except his pocketbook. He placed a dollar in the plate and sang with might and main, when we asunder part, it gives me inward pain. <laughs> so a lot of people talk big about, about their lives, but you can tell their lies if they're willing to open it up to you in their checkbook, in their daytimer, and in their uh, daily planner. That what, You do what you do because you love what you love. Nothing's too good for what you really love. And your money is an infallible in indicator of what you really love. Some people outwardly love the Lord, but inwardly have an inordinate love of the riches 
of the world. And that's the measure of a woman. That's a measure of a man, how you think about your money. That's what we find out, and you find out about your true character and your true faith. Uh, really, to use medical analogy, money is absolutely diagnostic. It's idio. Syncratic. It absolutely is a one-on-one -on -one correlation with what you really believe and who you really are. Uh, to put it in human terms, uh, money management is an area where men make money, but God makes men and God makes women. There are different kinds of riches, and we're going to study that today. Jesus said in Luke 16 uh, to deal with unrighteous mammon, not been faithful with unrighteous mammon. Who will give you true riches? We won't go into that today, but there is a category of unrighteous mammon. And then behind the smoke and mirrors, there is a category of true riches and true wealth. Outwardly has much, inwardly nothing. We like newspapers. My wife, like, so she reads lots of newspapers, and I read a lot too. Uh, I like the Wall Street Journal. And on Friday, it has this column called Mansion. It has all these tycoons up in the... Uh, Oh, up north, you know, somewhere in Connecticut and different places that are day traders and hedge fund people, and they make just unbelievable money. And, the, and really, the houses are ridiculous. It's like a cartoon houses. Plus, they all hate each other. And they're, they're always, the house was, is held up because it's their uh, fourth motion for an angry divorce with their eighth wife, and they're just furious, and it does them no good. Now, that's not in our real world. Uh, now, this may apply to you. If it does, I'm not thinking of you. But in subdivisions, after subdivisions, we go out and look at real nice subdivisions to get landscaping ideas and flowers and things like that. But I noticed that most people in these beautiful subdivisions have built wonderful porches and nobody is ever on the porch, ever. When you grew up, there were rocking chairs and there were porches and there were screen doors and everybody was outside after supper till it was dark while you were playing spotlight and rolling around in the yard and playing kickball, which nobody out goes out, kids don't go outside anymore. But nobody ever is on the porch relaxing. And my probably wrong feeling, I hope, is that they spend all their money to get into this house to impress everybody and they no longer have, they're working three jobs and they don't get to sit on the porch and relax. You say, that's me, it's not you. I have no idea whether you have porches on your house or not. Well, two-point message, very easy, inward wealth, outward wealth, worldly, passing, fading, often unrighteous mammon wealth versus true riches. Number one of a two-point outline, hold your breath for that, uh, <laughs> the poverty of the godless rich. There is that maketh rich, yet you are in abject poverty. Mark this up front. This is an heart attitude Problem. The Bible does not condemn, per se, you having or owning wealth. God uses uh, some wealthy people for, and, and anybody that's in America, anybody that lives in an air-conditioned or heated house that has electricity or natural gas or something, in the economy of God, you are a wealthy person. Uh, I mean, 99% of the Christians in the world, you're in the top 1%. You ever hear about the top 1%? You're the top 1%. You say, I don't believe it. You talk to our missionaries. You talk to those people at bio. And, and also, uh, just because there is no penalty against uh, wealth, there is also no premium on poverty. Some people just dress around and have, they hang their head, and it's more bad posture than anything else, but they just whine along and say, oh, if we just live the simple life. There's, there's nothing wrong with the simple life, I guess, but poverty doesn't equal piety. I have bad news for you. I, 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 you may work from home, and my daughters do now, both of them work at home from computers. I deal with people and people that I charge money to, which is the equation where people get really mad. Anything you deal with somebody in a, in a transactional sense, those of you in small business, I, I know about people. Uh, most of the rich people I know in, in the world, most of them are mean as cross-eyed snakes, but also most of the poor people I know in the world is mean as cross-eyed snakes. People are just mean. The world is not going to be necessarily a happy place whether you rub money into it or not. So you have to disconnect yourself from the pretensions that the poverty gospel will make you more holy, just like the prosperity gospel will not make you more holy. That, that is not really the issue. Abraham was a man rich in silver and gold. David was a man after God's own heart, full of days, riches and honor. You don't like that. God didn't mind that. He was glad to do it. He used it for another generation yet to come. 
Joseph of Arimathea. He ordered his tomb. He paid the opening and closing fee. He got the coffin and everything ready. And he didn't know necessarily that it was going to be an answer to prophecy. And in his tomb, Jesus was to be laid after his death. We're glad he had that money. We're glad he put it to good use. It's not wrong to have wealth biblically, but that there are times when a wealthy man may only be wealthy in the things of the world, material wealth, and is impoverished in spiritual things, a wealthy pauper in the sense. So let me give you some categories. You know these. Hopefully they don't apply to you. If they don't, write them down. They might help you with somebody else who's struggling. When is a man rich but not rich? I like riddles. When are a man rich but not rich? The poverty of the godless rich. Number one, a man is poor when he's seeking satisfaction in his money. You've been to funerals. I've been to funerals. The, the, the person of honor at the funeral does not care a bit about how much money was spent on this. There's nothing wrong with having a good funeral, a nice funeral. That's wonderful. But in Proverbs 13, 7, it says, There is that that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. He has nothing in this case, the Bible says. Money, therefore, you know, at least in some people, cannot satisfy the longings of the heart or the deepest longings of the heart. And the thing with money is you'd always like just a little bit more. Uh, Wes and I were talking a minute ago. Do you know the definition of old people? People that are 10 years older than you. <laughs> no matter how old you are, they're, you're not old. I feel great. Uh, but those that are 10 years older, poor old people. It's just a shame to see them aging. So, well, that's it. Uh, money is the same way. We always want a little bit more. A wise, poor man talked to uh, a foolish rich man one day and said, did you know that I am more wealthy than you? And the rich man said, I don't think so. How so? He said, because I have all the money I need and you don't. That's exactly right. Contentment is the crown jewel of the Christian life, uh, the old Puritan writer said. Uh, look at Ecclesiastes, or just write it down. I'll read it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 4 through 11. This is the Bill Gates of this day. This is the Elon Musk of the day. This is Solomon. As far as we can tell, he could put all these boys to shame now, plus there's no income tax back in those days. Here's what Solomon said it, looking back. He said, I made me great works. I builded me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions and small and great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine heart, mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. And then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and all the labor that I labored to do, and behold, it was vanity. You know what vanity means? Nothing. Emptiness. Vapor. All was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. He had it all, but in the end it was worthless, absolutely nothing. Emptiness, vanity, no profit. In that day, uh, he could buy wives in the sense of servants, but no love. Uh, the round world would never fit into the contour of his three-cornered heart. He could not heal the bloody wounds of a wasted life. In that sense, as a rich man who actually had gotten all the things that the world lust after, he knew they wouldn't work. A poor man uh, really was worse because he was still living in the delusion that if he ever got money, that would make him happy. The rich man here did, knows it did not make him happy. Um, that's the idea. Do you watch shows on TV? You probably don't. Well, it gets late at night. I've got all these charts to do, and I'm on call. The phone's going to keep ringing. So uh, gradually all the serious news goes away in all the sports, and you've got HGTV to realize that your house is no good and that you need to borrow money and completely redo it. Or 
Lottery disasters, don't watch that. These people win the lottery, they kill each other about half the time, apparently within a month. They're all divorced in six months and they absolutely turn into the worst people you've ever saw. And you think I'm willing to take the risk. Don't, I mean, just really, it's not worth it if you watch those shows. Uh, inside Matters, listen to this quote, it's better, women, if you're not married, mark this down, it's better to marry a man who's worth a million even if he doesn't have a cent than to marry a man who's not worth 10 cents even though he has millions. And you know that's true. The inside things matter. Number one, poverty of the godless rich. A man or a woman is poor when they are seeking satisfaction in their money. Number two, a man or a woman is poor when their money increases their trouble. Look in, and we're going to be flipping through here, so I'll go as steadily as I can. Proverbs 15, 6. Proverbs 15, 6 says, In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked is trouble. Chapter 15, verse 16 says, Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Who wants trouble? When money increases your trouble, it's not worth it at half the price. Look at Proverbs 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You talk to people that are getting divorced and coming out of some beautiful home they have built as if that was going to save their marriage. And you talk to them about how they started out. And they had a lot more fun eating pizza on the back porch or scraping Chinese out of those little white boxes sitting on their furniture because... They cared about each other, and, and the God of this world didn't throw uh, money into their face and have them worship that. Uh, I've heard people, I've heard people that are real foodies, and I, I like food, but look down on it. I heard one of them say, "Oh, it's the kind of person that would eat spam." I love spam. When we grew up, my mother would get that spam. She would let me take that key and get the thing off, and then you would move it. It is pretty yucky that jelly type stuff but you'd get that off and she let me cut it in little squares and we would fry it up and then you put eggs in it and cheese and I thought the rest of the day was just great I think this is the best thing I've ever had in my life I can see my mother saying well do you want some spam I go yes yes I do and for people to make fun of something that might bring you joy like uh, worrying about hot dogs or something. You get a fire and cook some hot dogs. The second one's better than the first, and the third one's better than the second. They're wonderful. Uh, macaroni and cheese with joy and peace is better than filet in an angry house. They are givers than there are takers. Listen to this quote. Takers eat better, but givers sleep better. What matters more? Uh, these things turn into a burden. Uh, this is for women. There's a man that noticed a woman on a train, and she had this fabulous diamond on her finger. And uh, he watched it. She noticed he was watching it. She said, oh, what do you think? It's the Clockman diamond. And he goes, the Clockman diamond? She said, have you heard of it? He said, is it like the Hope diamond that it comes with a curse? She said, well, it's just as big and just as beautiful and just as clear. And like you said... The Clockman diamond comes with a curse. He said, what may I ask is the curse? She said, Mr. Clockman. <laughs> so you may have to give up your integrity if you want diamonds and jewels and live with some loser the rest of your life, and you're not going to like it. That diamond's going to fade in about a week. Uh, much that we possess with it has a curse, and much trouble comes with it. We're talking about the poverty of the godless rich. Number one, poor, when you seek satisfaction in money. Don't do that. Money's a useful tool, but it's a terrible master. Number two, money, uh, poor, when money increases your trouble. And you're, you're wise enough to have seen that in the lives of your friends, and hopefully not your life, but we've all fouled up so much, maybe so. Number three, money, a man is poor, or a woman is poor, when the aim of their life is the making of money. Now we're getting into heart uh, adoration and we're talking about God erecting or God trying to get you not to erect idols in your heart. Uh, read if you want to, just mark it down, Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 4. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Um, wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Money sings, it says, I'll fly away. Money talks, it says, goodbye. <laughs> it's absolutely gone. And Proverbs 28, verse 20. Let me find it. 
find it. A faithful man shall abound with blessing, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Warren Buffett's like 96 years old now or something like that, and he buys about eight stocks and holds them forever. Even for him, 96 is getting up there. But you know what he's doing during all these gyrations of the economy and stock market? Where he's not doing anything. He's eating cheeseburgers because he's made his settled plan, and he's not upset. Now, we're not Warren Buffett, but we can be settled in our heart when enough is enough and wisdom's been applied. If you don't do this, you'll start cutting corners. Sin will enter this part of your life. It'll warp your life. Proverbs 28, 22 says, He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Life is colored by all that you try to gain, uh, if that's true, you'll be lost in the pursuit of money and of gold. It'll warp your life. It'll warp your character. You say it won't. It will. You don't have to believe me. This is uh, the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, this is God's wisdom. Uh, a lot of people mean well, and they want people to work since nobody wants to work anymore, the TV news tells us, and people are quietly quitting and all these things. Uh, so some people say, listen, go work hard, make every bit of money you can as long as you do it honestly. That's not true. You will ignore your family, your children, you ignore your Sunday school, you will not, you'll not do anything. That's wrong. That's out of bounds priority. When you ought to be praying, exercising, sleeping, helping, loving your family, when money becomes the overwhelming, overarching, consuming, all-consuming drive of your life, it doesn't matter whether you tithe that money or whether you gave it to a good purpose. You've wasted your life. That was never meant to be the goal of your life. It was to be a means and a mechanism. That's the idea. Getting that idea in your mind that get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can, bury the can out in the backyard, check on it four times a night, that will warp, twist, and distort your life. You're pursuing the wrong thing. Let me read you another really good verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Don't you want great gain? Well, we've talked about things that the world thinks are great gain, but they're not. Here's something that the world thinks is absolutely worthless. Contentment, who cares about that? Stay up late and work hard all the time and ruin your health and never see your kids. And, and, and that's the, what the world has to do. Contentment is... Godliness with contentment is great gain. That is absolutely far into the way the world thinks. Therefore, it might be true because whatever the world's been doing has not been working at all. That's it. With food and raiment, therewith be content. Food and clothes are better than we deserve, and who wants sorrows? Let's read 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 11. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Not money, but for the love of money. Here were heart attitudes again. Is the root of all sorts of evil, which while some coveted after, they erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, here's contradistinction, here's a pivot, here's something placed in, in opposition to what's been said. But thou, O man of God, Flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Almost sounds like a description of being filled with the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. Against such there's no law. That's the idea. That's the idea. This applies to the money life. Number four, we're talking about the poverty of the godless rich. Poor when seeks satisfaction in money. Poor when wants when money increases trouble. Poor when the aim of the life, this is the heart attitude that matters. Man looks on the outward appearance. God, your wife, your dog, your kids, your friends, they know, they can see the inside of your heart here uh, when the aim of his life is the making of money. Number four, a man is poor because your heart's going to stop sooner than you think. A man is poor when he has no treasure in heaven. Wouldn't you like to go? We went to, our daughter lives in Denver, and we'd never been out to Denver, but now she's going to have a baby, Rebecca, which she never thought she was going to, so this is exciting, but we were going to be out going to Denver a lot. Well, we went out there, and uh, they had a nice uh, hotel pretty close to where they lived, and they had this thing where they would put uh, a little tray, like with cheese and crackers out there. I said, now this is my kind of place. I've been looking for this my whole life. Open the door, 
There's a little sign that says it's in the fridge. I rub my chubby little hands and head right after it. I think that is great. You know, where I'm going, I want there to be good food. You say, well, come over to, to my house and, uh, and we will, uh, we'll, it, we'll talk about some food. Or that's a wasp, I think, so be careful. We'll, we'll talk about some food. Well, you can do that. I'm going to somebody's house that has some food. I want it to be real. A man is poor when he has no treasure in heaven. Pro- Proverbs 23, 5. Let me read this next one. It talks about how quickly uh, money is gone on earth. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. The ones at Dollywood are behind a big screen for their safety. And so they can't take off. But can you imagine those giant wings if they took off, like in National Geographic Channel or something, and those huge wings, and they just they start going faster and faster. That's what money does when you try to grasp it and hold on to it and not use it for God's glory. Um, look at Proverbs 27 and verse 24. Proverbs 27 and verse 24. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. That could fit into a child-rearing talk. You need to know how to pass down. We had a, a money class over at the old old uh, church building one time. Roger Griffith taught it, and Dale, Dale taught one. I, I went to all these classes. And they talked about that in the Jewish uh, economy of life, that people started transferring their wealth at about age 35 to start teaching the next generation how to handle things. And they didn't live as long maybe at that point in, their, in, in, in human history, but still that was earlier than most people do now. And it shows how you're wise to realize, verse 24, that riches are not forever and the crown doth not endure to every generation. Queen Elizabeth lasted a long time, but eventually that crown has to move on to the next person. And lay up not for yourselves treasures on earth, but in heaven where no moth, no rust, no thief is going to steal it or ruin your return. Nothing into the world, nothing out of the world. I promise you they'll take nothing out of this world. No U-Hauls behind hearses. You can't, you, all that you'll carry to heaven is what you've given away. Uh, we, people have lots of uh, money, but it may not go to any good. Now, we're very exciting people. You probably just need to stand back. But we watch almost every night uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune because I like to, I've won millions of dollars. The money's on the way, I'm sure. But I, and Nancy's really good at it, too. Uh, and we've been studying this. And uh, Vanna is 65 and Pat's 73. And they make $10 million a year, both of them, each individually, playing that game. And I know that she gave... Uh, $2 million of it to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. I, I did some of my training there, the Bonner Children's Hospital in St. Jude. It's wonderful. So good for her and good for Vanna. She's from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We hope that this, I hope that there is some spiritual life there, that, that some of her energy and her effort will be going, and yours too, no matter whether you have any zeros or not. Uh, that's a lot of money, but what is it? What, the main thing is what is the heart attitude with it? She can't take it with her. Pat can't take it with him. You and I don't have that much, but we, we can't take what we're going either. Uh, the principle is true for everybody. Um, if you, if you want to talk about human misery, talk to a lawyer about someone who hasn't a clear will when grandma dies and you find out she always had that thousand acre farm which she never told you about that her dad left her, and now it's blood on the water, razor blades a thousand feet in the air, when there's money and blood involved. And people don't realize that they can't take it with them either. Your real worth, any county, any situation, out west or east coast, is all that money can't buy and death can't take away. You can't, I've, I heard that 30 years ago. It's never gotten out of my mind. I know I've said it a dozen times here, and I'm going to say it a dozen more if it comes up in, the, in, in this. Your real worth is figured up. You get your accountant, you know, they don't look at it. They just can do that thing with their fingers. All that you money can't buy, death can't take away. True, mit- too rich, true riches are marked by this. When you give them away, they increase. False riches are marked by this. When you divide them, they diminish. America is having a political and economic and character crisis because we think you can uh, increase money by dividing it. You can't do it. 
That's not what, how it works. True riches, the more I give of it, the more I have of it. That's why a greedy man is so unhappy. This, I hope, is not you. I'm sure it's not. But listen to what I say. Uh, he that spends the first half of his life trying to get everything he can from everybody else and then spends the second half of his life making sure they don't get it back. He, erect, he erects barriers and walls and barbed wire and broken bottles on the top. He's miserable in both halves while he's grabbing it away from everybody and while he's trying to protect it from everybody. That's the idea. In my, in my world, a lot of people spend their, they, they lose their health trying to gain wealth and at the end of their life they spend every dime they have trying to get their health back. Whereas somebody that was happy with what they had and godliness with contentment is great gain was happy all along. That's the idea. A real riches, you're not trying to keep others away. Really, you have something and you want them to have it. And the more they give away in that situation, the more they possess. That's the idea. Finally, on this section, poverty of the godless wealth, a man is a poor man, bottom line, heart attack dead, if he doesn't have Jesus Christ. You say, well, the political people on TV say we need family values. I'm sure we do, but that's not, that's just too vague. This, uh, you say, well, we, uh, we have, I have my personal faith. Everybody has personal faith. Uh, the, the object of your faith makes all the difference. The fact of your faith or the intensity of your faith, unless it's attached to the right object, does not really uh, go into your ledger as good or bad. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, back to the left, and verse 4. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Here's, here's your last days, which you don't know when they are. Most people don't. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness, and you can just mark down Jesus Christ, is our righteousness. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, one who has perfect righteousness, who is willing to offer that on God's ledger book as a credit for you that wipes out all your debt and puts you in a good position with God. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. That's what we want. It doesn't say riches deliver from death. I have in my family lots of people that I worry about their health, and they, they've saved their money, and they say, well, if I get in trouble, I'll go up to Mayo Clinic. I'll be fine. Well, God bless Mayo Clinic, but it doesn't, it's not in the righteousness exalting business. It's not in the deliver from death business. That's the idea. Uh, false riches are marked by this and true riches are marked by this. Christ profits in the day of wrath. God's provision of human righteousness, what Adam should have had, perfect in the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, applied to your account when you by faith account, take his sacrifice as yours and his riches as yours also. That's the idea. You won't buy your way out of that court date. Rich or not, you have a life to live, a death to die, a judgment to face. You say, I don't want to go there. Too bad. That's the other shows I watch. Cops, that's a great show. That's all from the 1990s. They have, the, they have to stop and get on pay phones now. <laughs> but there's some new ones uh, where they're, I, I got eight or ten of these precincts and then they've got they're down at jail and everybody's fighting and throwing things at each other. And, and you just admire the jailers. They're so calm and cool and collected. And the troopers are doing a good job. You watch all that. Uh, but you talk to people and you say, this is no way to live. You're going to answer for this. I'll worry about that when I get there. No, you have a life to live, a death to die, a judgment to face. You won't wiggle your way out. No fancy lawyer will get you out of that court date. The old song says, dressed in his righteousness alone, then you are faultless before the throne. Your righteousness is never faultless. Luke 16, Jesus told the story of a rich man dressed in royal robes, ate lots of good food daily, a beggar lay at his gate named Lazarus. In verse 22 of Luke 16, they both died. The rich man was buried. It was quite a funeral. Cadillacs and Lincolns and Mercedes and whatever else they had then and they talked about and lied about what a great wonderful man he was verse 23 says in hell he lifted up his eyes between the death of a Christ rejecting man in verse 22 and God's comment in verse 23 that's how long it takes for someone to go to hell they're in hell before 
the phone rings at Fieldings or Fairs. Absolutely, it's instantaneous. Just like you, absent from the body, present with the Lord, absent from Christ, present in condemnation, very, very quickly. A riches profit not in the day of wrath. You say, I'm rich, good for you. I'm intelligent, I hope you are. I'm charming, we all think it's true. <laughs> it's no good if you don't know Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John 5, this is the record God's given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He that hath the life, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Period, end of story, next paragraph. Deal with it. Black ink, white paper. You say, I don't like that. I wouldn't either the way that we've lived, but aren't you glad we have a substitute? Now, we've still got enough time here. The second and final point is not only the poverty of the godless rich, but the prosperity of the godly poor. Now, you don't have to be dead poor to understand this, that you're not one of the mighty ones of the world, some hedge fund trader or some Pharisee in that day. We go back again to Proverbs 13:7 and get a running start. Proverbs 13, 7 says, There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. TV theology is exactly the other way. You go to Christ, you give money and you go to people, you give money in faith, and they'll give you more money, and God will make sure you come out ahead. Your bank account will be running over. Problem. You're going to have to talk to Paul, Peter, James, every apostle, every disciple, every early Christian, every uh, Christian in a persecuted position now today, 99% of people are not going to be fitting that story. And you're going to tell them why you're a better Christian than they are. And they, Paul, <laughs> who's writing most of the New Testament in the epistle, he appears to have misunderstood something that now you've figured out. Faith in the spirit-filled life in your theology includes the key to Fort Knox and the way to get is to give and you're only giving to get. Send in money and God will send you more back. I don't believe it. If you need it, God will send you more back. Never broadcast that in Bangladesh. Never broadcast that in the Philippines. Never broadcast that in a slum. It doesn't work. That doesn't fit. You answer that. I don't want to be anywhere near you. I've got enough to answer for myself. It's true that the Bible does not hardwire earthly piety to economic poverty. But it's also true historically and geographically and sociologically that most Christians around the world are poor and are, are not in a position of power. We've grown up in an uh, outwardly Christian-influenced nation, which is all fading away now. So we, just, we have a hard time understanding this, but it's true. It was true in Bible times, it was true in history, and it's true today. He hath chosen, the Bible says, the poor of this world, rich in faith. And you're trying to weld the concepts of richness from the Bible, rich in faith, to rich in your bank account. There's no condemnation of wealth rightly used or held. I get that in this in perspective. But the best of them in that day said, silver and gold have I none, and we'd rather have what they had than silver or gold now. So watch out for prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, who masquerade as prophets, P-H-E-T-S. That's the idea. Watch out for prosperity cults. God very clearly will help you earn and manage money by principles in the Bible. We've studied those. They do. You'll be much better off when you do that. You'll have financial peace. You'll find a soft pillow in, in getting in on God's program. But question, why are the poor sometimes rich in faith? Well, number one, their riches are spiritual riches. And you don't be so carnal as to raise up your nose at that. There'll come a time when money or not, you'll wish you had peace, love, joy, forgiveness, right with God, hope for the future, meaning for today. That wasp is really not, this must be an important message. <laughs> I don't know if I can get that or not. It's right on my Bible. We'll take a brief pause. <laughs> oh, I wish I could smash that thing. It's, it's in the wrong, it's right next to the microphone. Oh, I wish I could get that. And you wish so too, because this when if it leaves here, it's going to fly out to you. Now let me see if I can read from here. <laughs> What's a big looking wasp? <laughs> Maybe 
sound therapy will get rid of it. Well, let's see. Riches or spiritual riches. Oh, there's, there, well, I can't read the next verse either. <laughs> Gosh, just, uh, just wait a minute. If it'll move over to the left, I'll get it. I've never had this happen in my life. <laughs> Boy, I wish that would move. Well, their riches are also secure riches, if I can find 13 and 11. It says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Money you earn by hard work is a lot more secure. You value it a lot more, and you're not likely to get rid of it. Oh, he's getting close now. sure I get that. I hate wasps. They scare me to death. I think I do. He's still, he's still wiggling, but not for long. <laughs> uh, all right, he squished to death. Now, where was I? Here we go. <laughs> Their riches are secure, Proverbs 13, 11. Let's go back and read that again. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. That which increases by labor shall be increased. Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Good things for your children. Good things for your grandchildren. You know what that picture is? That's somebody who's not money focused, but is using money wisely for things that matter. Maybe you have a second job, or maybe you have... Uh, something like that that could help your kids that you're sending them to a Christian college or something and maybe you're trying to work harder because you've, you've got money that will make a difference in their life. A man with true riches leaves true riches, secure riches, laid up in heaven, incorruptible, a godly legacy. Number three, not only are their riches spiritual and secure, but they're satisfying. There is no satisfaction in that section of the Wall Street Journal on Friday for mansions. It is, uh, one, I, I saw that, y'all seen the Alan Iverson selling car shield? Have you seen that, Ann? Alan Iverson, the answer. The answer, I mean, he, he was the NBA most valuable player, worth millions upon millions. He lost every bit of it. It was uh, jewelry, make sure that thing's not moving. It's jewelry, uh, all sorts of bad decisions. I'm not judging, he probably was not instructed in this and that's an awful lot of money and he's a very he was a very young man well I read a story about his agent and years and years ago they put in a five million dollar I think annuity that he would get at 50 years old well back then that was nothing to Alan Iverson you know the NBA most valuable player well now he's broke and he's, he's in a TV ads for Car Shield trying to get people to, and there's nothing wrong with Car Shield, I'm just, and, but he's not making millions of dollars doing that. He's trying to just basically make it to give that one more chance that he'll have that bunch of money he's going to get at 50. And I hope and pray that he takes a good Dave Ramsey course or something and enjoys the rest of his life. Solomon could not find true riches any more than Alan Iverson did. Neither will you find them till you find them in the Lord. Here's some good stories about different ways God's people can handle money. There was a missionary, a, a lady missionary, who packed her trunk. She was going up the gangplank years ago with her trunk to go onto the field in Africa. And a, a friend came up, and they meant well, and they gave her a sealed envelope and said, if you ever get in trouble and you ever have great needs, this should take care of you. God bless you, and just use it whenever you need to. Thirty years later, she came home from the field. That envelope was still sealed. She said, I never had a need that my God through Jesus Christ could meet me. When Spurgeon was building the, <laughs> the great uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, uh, he took over after being pastor at Water Beach, which was, a, which was a village which makes New Market look like New York, at 17 years old. And then he became pastor of the New Park Street Pulpit. And they had a big church. It was three or 400 seats and only about 10 people there. Well, after he'd been there, they filled it up and had no room. And he started to build years ago, right before 1861, when they moved into the Metropolitan Tabernacle, 
this great edifice. And, and the American Civil War was starting and the world situation, and he was a little bit worried, although he's a man of faith, and a rich man in London said, ride with me in my carriage. And he took him to the top of the hill and he looked over London and they could see the construction of the Metropolitan Tabernacle going up and the rich man said, I'm delighted to see your people are so excited about the new building and what God's doing. He said, uh, your building is paid for. I, here, I, the money is set aside. Anytime you want it, you need it. But I'm not going to say a word because you'll not need this. And we're not going to steal the joy of being part of this building program by knowing that it's paid for. But I'm going to give you the liberty to tell them that God Almighty is going to take care of us because he has. That's why he asked me to come today. Your building is paid for. But, and they never had to use it. The man never said a word during Spurgeon's lifetime. And the people got involved and the building went up debt free and, and he didn't steal the joy, which was wonderful. Now, isn't that wisdom in dealing with finances in a way that's much different than uh, the way that the Wall Street financiers would do that? Well, we're all done. Let me see if there's a last good quote for you since that wasp got me 90 seconds behind. We're talking about riches in Christ, and if so, our future is as bright as the promises of God. And the verse for today is, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he, yet he became poor, that she might be rich indeed in Christ. Lord, thank you for these wisdom and Proverbs and for teaching us and help us apply these to our lives. Amen. I've never had a wasp in the pulpit. I hate wasps.